Hello everyone. Welcome to the Indusind Bank presents The Finish Line, powered by Muse Wearables. I'm Saurav Ghoshal, and my second guest on the show today is considered one of the greatest players ever in his sport. He is a five-time world champion and indeed the first ever recipient of the prestigious Rajiv Gandhi Khel Ratna Award. He is none other than the great Vishwanath Anand. Today's episode on the finish line is all about Anand describing his most challenging match series ever. A chess prodigy since his childhood in Chennai, Anand always seemed destined for the stars. And when he became the world junior chess champion in 1987 in the Philippines and the world senior chess champion 20 years later after winning a tournament in Mexico, Vishwanathan Anand seemed to have already fulfilled every athlete's dream. But even as he clinched the tournament in Mexico City with an effortless 20-move draw against Peter Leko of Hungary, he knew his next objective was even more important. To defend his title a year later in Germany against Vladimir Kramnik in the traditional champion challenger format. 12 matches, 12 days, the first to reach 6.5 points would win. This was Anand's greatest challenge. Hi Anand, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us today. I'm going to start off this interview with uh, some sort of like background to your unbelievable rivalry with Kramnik. Um, you know, sport has given us many, many great rivalries. You have Federer Nadal, Senna Prost, uh, Messi Ronaldo maybe now and we can add Kramnik Arnolds to that. So, in your own words, what makes that rivalry so special and so memorable as part of your career? Well, we joined the top of uh, World Chess roughly the same time. Uh, I joined two years ahead of him. <clears throat> And at that point, I didn't remember it yet. But uh, later on, he told me that we had actually met three years before. And I didn't recognize him for a second because he had switched to wearing full trousers. But at that thing, he was a 14-year-old uh, in big shorts. And he had a cigarette in his hand. And I played him once in 1989. And kind of it had slipped my mind. But anyway, I met him again in uh, 92. And by this point, he had his breakthrough moment in June 92. I think out of these, uh, what, 20 odd years, we were uh, number two and three, swapping number two and three, um, maybe out of 12 years out of that. And we didn't swap the number one position because I had the number one position, we had had it a few years before. But uh, we were just always very, very close to each other. You know, when he got to a tournament, you would think, what am I going to do against him? Uh, even our lifetime score is uh, actually, it's when he retired, it stopped at zero. I mean, we are absolutely even over more than 150 games and we are exactly at the same score. So you've always been a 1-E4 player and he's always been a 1-B4 player and you decide you're going to go with 1-B4 in this big, you know, all stakes in kind of match for the world title. So what kind of like put you, you know, in this frame of mind or what kind of gave you this idea to go with something which he was so very good at and he's been doing it for forever and you've never done. So what made you go for something like that in such a high risk scenario? I looked at my recent games with him. Uh, I found that I was finding it very difficult to land the punch in E4. Um, it's... Uh, I mean, the kind of openings he plays against E4, I just even thought the positions we're going to get are going to be so boring, I don't want to sit there and play that kind of attrition chess. And um, I suddenly thought, why not play D4? It's something I've dabbled with, though I'm not very good at it, but I've dabbled with, why not play E4? And then it's one of these thoughts, it, it gets it gets into your head and you can't get it out of your head. I, I got excited by the thought of playing uh, D4, obviously because I hadn't thought it through. So, it's not a logical decision that 
I'm sure if I had written down pros and cons after a while, I would have convinced myself better not. For someone who might not understand, it's the equivalent of let's say Federer switching to his left hand against Nadal or something. You know, that's probably exaggerating it a bit. But D4 was scary. But at the same time, I knew that in D4 I would be excited about every moment because uh, I would not, uh, I would not be able to switch to autopilot, and therefore uh, I would be forced to. Work and I had this feeling of opening up new vistas, you know, new kinds of positions. Because I was going to start playing D4, I could choose almost any uh, sub variation which in D within D4. So it gave me, um, you know, a blank canvas to work on, and I was excited about the idea. I told my second, you know, he did the pros and cons list, and I, I kind of saw his point, but I figured that out myself, and it was just exciting. That's all. So you know the entire match, which is a best of twelve games, it's lasting almost a month or a bit more. In fact, um, you know you go through a lot of, you know you wake up every morning and you're a different person every day in some form or the other. You know you have emotional changes, whether it be a high or a low. Uh, you know some things work in your favor, some days some things don't. So how do you kind of deal with those uh, highs and lows emotionally, mentally, form wise as well? Through an entire almost a month, which is which is very difficult to do. You know, we play tournaments which are like lasting one week, and we are like first three days you're playing brilliantly, and then the fourth, fifth day things aren't going as well. And to do it over a month is a very very tough thing to kind of accomplish uh, at a stage as high as that because the quality is the same every single day from the opponent. So, what are the things that you do mentally as well as you know if you have certain ticks that you take care of yourself, which help you to get into that zone, so to say. Every time you go out and sit in front of that chess board. Well, for the World Championship, um, the schedule is fairly luxurious, but that gives you some starting points. So we used to play two games. That is one white, one black, and then there's a rest day, and then one white, one black, rest day, one, and so it goes. Um, and there's an extra rest day after game ten. So, and this means that you, the idea is to you. Take everything in two games at a time, and then on the rest day you push that aside and you think of the next one. The rest day gives you a chance to break it up into six mini matches instead of one long match. After the the best two games were the fifth and sixth because I won both of them. So between from one rest day to the next rest day when you arrived and the rest day after the sixth game, we all knew. I mean, it's again nobody dared say, it, but we all knew that the match was essentially over if I didn't mess up big time. And um, what that meant was now, now you know that something is very favorable for you is almost there, and now it's important you don't think about it at all because it can freak you out. So nobody mentioned it, nobody dare mention it, but we knew that there's a big lead and all that. And after that, my task became more limited, which was survive one game, push it. So because every game they finished made his uh, made his comeback more improbable. And the only real difficult moment was after game ten, because game ten he finally managed to pinpoint one weakness, and he was very very cunning about it, because he didn't do anything, he didn't refute what I did, he just came up with some new random move, and he knew that I'm so close to finishing the match that I almost couldn't, uh, I almost wanted it too badly. That's always the trickiest moment, uh, and that was a crisis. So for game eleven, uh, we were methodical. We had a rest day before game eleven, and we spent the whole rest day trying to make a draw. And literally rehearsing, 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 because the most important thing was uh, for me not to improvise. And the reason I say this is because normally I'm ready to improvise, but when you are in this frame of mind where, as we say, the hand wants to make a move and the heart wants to make a draw, then you don't know which direction you're going. And if you improvise, then at some point it's possible that your hand improvises in a direction your heart no longer thinks, and then there's conflict. Um, so it's important that. I be very uh, disciplined about my decision making. If I'm going to improvise, I have to make sure that I'm, it's a logical one, something like that. And so, really trying to train the process with that way. But we did such good work, and we had the white pieces, so uh, I managed to neutralize him fairly early. And in fact, uh, the eleventh game didn't last very long. And for the other days, I would say uh, it went brilliantly. I mean, seeing every match as a two-game thing. Uh, I only had to keep the tension within me for two days, and the third day was to unwind and so on. I think you've already touched upon it. 
but in terms of like you know this world title, the previous two you had won in a round robin and knockout like you mentioned, uh, but this one you won in the traditional kind of match play setting. Um, also the background where uh, you know the Soviets always counted everyone who were non-Soviets to be outsiders, and the Westerners thought of you as as an Easterner, so you didn't kind of kind of fit into a particular box, so to say. So you were an outsider in every form. So you know, in some way or the other, even though in your mind and people close to you, there was no asterisk next to your name in terms of the stuff that you had won. But winning this title in 2008, you know, doing it the traditional way, was it like your moment where you said, "I am here now. I am world champion. Like this is it." So I would say that after 1991. Uh, I got to know most of the um, Russian chess players as individuals, and uh, I, this Soviet uh, school angle had more or less disappeared. This notion that they were a group, and I mean, they're just as individualistic as the rest of us, and that was that. Uh, nonetheless, it should be stated that without realizing it, even I was the first non-Russian champion since Fischer. So I had not gone on about it. But I suddenly realized, hey, wait a minute, I'm the first non-Russian champion since Fisher in that line. Um, and as for the, uh, the importance of the match, um, well, we all like to say, you know, when people, uh, uh, we all like to say we don't care about what other people think. And that is partially true that in 2006 and 7, I put out, out of my head the thought that I should care about what other people think. But deep down, you know that some murmurs are there. Some people are saying, yeah, but it's not the match format and it's so-called. Um, in fact, it's quite funny when you're, when it doesn't work for you, you say, you call them snobs, you know, uh, what do they know and all that. And then when it works for you and uh, they're forced to admit that you're right, you say, yeah, yeah, because I qualify in that score as well. So it was kind of like that. I never wanted to admit that, that, uh, that I needed to buy some more legitimacy or get acquire some more legitimacy, but having gotten it, I can't say that I complain. Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, you know, being a young boy, like I've, I've read about, you know, all the stuff that you've done and I'm so happy that you actually did it, you know, because with everything that you've achieved, it's something like, uh, you know, one of the best players ever would not have had that in his kind of repertoire of achievement, so to say. So, I'm, you know, congratulations, so happy that you actually managed to to win that match in 2008 and, and silence all the so-called naysayers and doubters and you know all of that. That's all I have for you. Thank you so much for sharing your super inspiring story. I'm sure everyone watching this will learn so much from everything that you've done. I myself am hopeful that I can learn and use some of the stuff in my career moving forward. So thank you so much and enjoy your time in Chennai where you are right now and, uh, and stay safe and, and be well. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Stay safe as well. And uh, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. So that was a really enlightening conversation with Vishwanath and Anand. And there is so much to learn from him. The biggest takeaway for me was the risk he took to play a completely different opening against Kramnik. He knew from his past record that he had to change the game and take Kramnik into unfamiliar territory. His strategy caught Kramnik by surprise, and that makes it our Indusind Bank's most bankable moment. And talking about changing the game, Indusind Bank has been doing their bit in the world of chess. They partnered with the All India Chess Federation for the Blind for the National School Chess Championships for the Visually Impaired, where more than 260 players from 16 states in the age groups of 8 to 17 years participated. Truly amazing, isn't it? Vishwanathan Anand has inspired us over all these years, not just as a great champion, but also as someone who revolutionized the sport of chess in India. He continues to do so by guiding the Indian team to the gold medal at the Chess Olympiad just this past week. It's been truly a pleasure speaking with him. Sometimes a single moment define success. A fraction of a second makes a legacy and that legacy inspires an entire nation. 
Muse Wearables believes in holding on to such moments and honoring the individual's journey. So it's now time for the Muse Wearables contest question. Muse Wearables contest. Question. In which year did Vishwanathan Anand win the first ever Rajiv Gandhi Kail Ratna Award? Options A. 1998 B. 2002 C. 1992 D. 1996 Answer the question and stand a chance to win an exclusive timeless collection of a new age hybrid smart watches from Muse. Simply follow these steps to enter the contest. Conditions apply.